everybody and welcome to another episode of Cruising Israel. I'm your host, Natalie. And I'm Max. This week on the show, guys, we are going to be taking you to Israel's southern region. We're going to be exploring all of what the south of Israel has to offer. Lots of different farms, different innovations that are, you know, created down there. And lots of time on the road. Yeah, that's true. Not far down there. A couple hours drive. South, so what's our first center. stop? What are we checking out? Well, first stop, we're going to Be'er Sheva, which is what people say is the capital of the southern region. Um, it's one of the biggest cities down there. And they actually have a visitor center where we just get an introduction to the south. Cool. Sounds, that sound? sounds interesting. Let's go check that out. Israel is divided into three major regions. It's fertile north, it's bustling center, and the south, which is pretty much mostly desert. Today, we're going to visit a place that focuses on the past, present, and future of the Negev Desert. The Negev Desert constitutes over half of the land in Israel. And while it features a breathtakingly beautiful desert landscape, it sits just a few hour drive from Israel's central region. But don't be fooled, it's not just a dry, empty, and barren place with no life. Rather, it's quite the opposite, and it is home to not only modern Israeli families, but also some of Israel's biggest innovators. Usually people imagine the Negev is a place of camels and sand and a yeah. dry place, but we want to show uh, the beautiful part of the Negev. Situated in the largest and arguably most cosmopolitan city of Israel's southern region, Be'er Sheva welcomes guests to learn all about the wonders of the Negev Desert. The exhibits here at the Visitor Center cover what's happening in the Negev today and what's in store for the future, exploring not only groundbreaking innovations in agriculture, but advancements in higher education and its use in renewable energy as well. All these vegetables are the vegetables that grow in the Negev. One of the things that the Negev is in them is the farming this is an area that has been neglected for so many years and people haven't believed in it. And uh, have, coming down here you can see that people are making the dream into a reality. People are developing industries, they're developing places of nature, places of recreation, and places where it's a real quality of life to live here, beautiful communities. By coming to, to the museum um, of Charles de Negev, we were going to get a better understanding of all of the latest technological advancements that are happening in the, in the Negev. It's so important to know how to develop uh, this arid part of our country, and not only for ourselves, but for the benefit of the entire world. So this is the place to go to um, when you want an introduction to Israel's Negev desert. I think even some Israelis are not even aware of like the things to do here in the Negev and how it's such a developing city. Each year there's more and more innovations and different businesses growing here, right? Yeah, so actually most of our uh, visitors are Israelis. But people don't know many of cultural life that we have in the Negev and we try to show it just in a different way, in a positive way. The small cities dotting the Negev had doubled in population in the past 10 to 15 years. And Be'er Sheva, which people like to call the capital of the Negev, has made leaps and bounds compared to previous decades. So by becoming the South's center for innovation and technology, and being the home to some of Israel's leading universities, who knows just what kind of amazing innovations the Negev has in store. Yeah, visitor center is uh, kind of cool. I like the moving notebook thing. It's pretty high tech. Yeah, everything you need to know about the South, you can start over there. So let's get into some real examples, though. I want to go see some places in action. What you got? Okay, well, you're in luck because I called a few different farms. We're going to go visit a place called Melo Hatene, um, and it's more south than Be'er Sheva. Okay. Um, there's lots of greenhouses, and we'll be able to pick veggies. Veggies. Pick veggies and fruit, so it'll be fun. We'll learn about how they grow such juicy, amazing crops in such a harsh environment. Wow, so, well, that's pretty cool. Usually this time of year, you don't have that option. Well, we'll go and we'll learn everything from
agriculture is just one of the major industries that Israel excels at. And the bulk of it all is happening in some of the country's driest lands. Now you may think that sounds impossible, but Israelis are constantly coming up with innovative ways to make the desert bloom. The agricultural moshav of En Yahav in Israel's central Arava is the oldest and largest in the region. Wow, look how much basil. <laughs> Never ending, these columns. <laughs> yeah. Here is where 60% of Israel's fresh vegetable export originates and is home to 160 greenhouses, all filled with vegetables such as peppers, melons, pumpkins, and even 40 varieties of tomatoes. Wow, look how shiny these look. Shiny and so red. Around 75% of the families living here on the Moshav are farmers, and some of them even happen to be the children or grandchildren of the very first residents who settled here shortly after Israel's independence. Enyav was born in 1959 by two people who are here, Chagi and during its early stages, not many thought of living in this region, let alone establishing farms. But despite the hardships that the few settlers faced, they managed to change the dry desert's reputation. In order to grow crops, I mean, everybody knows that you need a few very basic things. You need a lot of sunlight, which the desert here in Israel has a lot of. Um, but you also need good soil and water, which is lacking here. The biggest problem that we have here is the, the water, and it's a very, very big issue for us. The soil is also a problem. Look on the soil that we are uh, uh, standing on. It's a very, rocks. very problematic soil with a lot of rocks, no organic matter, nothing that can grab the water. But we did find very good solutions. First of all, inside the soil in this area, there is a huge amount of water with two major problems. First of all, we need to drill very, very, very deep to get to this water, up to the depth of 1,600 meters. The second is the quality of the water, because we are talking about salty water. Right. In order for residents to drink filtered water, the water needs to go through a desalination process at a facility which is found at each and every moshav. But for agriculture, the water is used as is, and is pumped from underground by the 60 wells which is located around the Arava Valley. If you will look on your left, you will see a reservoir. Here we have a huge amount of water under this cover. We are pumping the water to this reservoir 24-7 all year long. And during the morning when all of us need the water, we are taking a huge amount of water from this reservoir. On your right, you can see another reservoir, which is a beautiful one. Those water comes here as a flash flood. Whenever we have rain in the mountains, in the Mitzperamon mountains, the water comes as a flood and stuck here. So in here, when we have a lot of floods, our water for irrigation are better. The quality is better because they are less salty. Although the Moshav is situated in the heart of the desert, its tall palm trees, lush grass, and many greenhouses make you feel as if you're in a desert oasis. Good, right? Very crunchy. <laughs> Utilizing its desert advantages, summer vegetables can be grown here all year round, including its biggest export crop, the pepper. This is where most of the money comes from in the Arava, growing those amazing peppers and selling them around the world, mainly to Russia, also to Europe, and just a little bit to America. Now you just only have bit. one kind of peppers here, or a few different? We have, the proportion is 70% red, 20% yellow, and 10% orange. The rest of the crop, is tomato, eggplant, watermelon, zucchini. Those stays in the domestic market. So winter is when uh, you guys make all the money. Oh, yeah. And all the business is thriving in the winter time, right? Yeah. Half of the year, you are getting no money. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the winter. Hopefully, that's going to be a good winter. All of the farmers here in the Arava use beneficial insects in the fields as an alternative to spraying chemicals, a method which was pioneered here in Israel. Ah, it smells so good. You know, I can't, I can't spell it now. After 
This is my sixth year as a growing person. You can't person. smell it anymore. Yeah, I, something happened to, to my ability to smell. Jewish people are not allowed to eat insects, not even a small one that you cannot see. So, the, mostly the Orthodox Jews are willing to pay more money for herbs, what we call kosher herbs. Uh, actually, what I mean is herbs that someone already checked them and make sure that they are free from insects. If I want to harvest this one, for an example, I need to tell him before he comes, he takes about two kilos. If he will find, I cannot harvest. So you don't use any of the insects um, like you used in the peppers? The no, peppers. no, beneficial insects, they are very, very good, but I cannot use them here because they are insects also. Rami's greenhouse is highly protected, so no insects can make their way to the herbs the double netted door and a sticky plastic surrounding the crops. So for those of you that think Israel's desert is a hopeless, lifeless environment, think again. Well, that was really cool. I've never seen that much basil in my life. We were just at the center, the very center of all the greenhouses in the Arava. Yeah, it's cool to see where some of the food that we've tasted comes from. And those, the farm was huge. I couldn't believe how many greenhouses there were. Yeah, it seemed to go on forever. It was tasty. There was some tasty peppers yeah. over there. Well, the next place we're actually going to visit is the Vidor Visitor Center. And what goes on there, there's a research and development center. And it's all about the experiments of the different veggies that are grown in the south, what works, what doesn't work. Sounds interesting. We're going to go check that out now. Let's go. Let's do it. With the Negev Desert taking up about half of Israel, you may expect much of the country to be dry and barren. But here in central Arava, we'll find many examples of Israelis actually trying to make the desert bloom. The Arava extends from the Dead Sea to Israel's most southern city of Elat and is divided into central and southern regions. The climate here naturally yields harsh conditions and sandy soil with no minerals. But in spite of all this, the central Arava manages to maintain 460 active farms, and most of the residents rely on farming for a living. So Israel is basically divided into two sections. We have the north, which is very fertile, easy to grow, and then we have the south, which is more harsh, arid conditions. But much of the desert is used for agricultural purposes, right? Yeah, well actually that's the miracle. Uh, maybe in the most uh, difficult place to grow agriculture, you've got a thriving agricultural community. Very little will grow here without human intervention. Yet, the central Arava produces more than 60% of Israel's fresh vegetables. The other countries should take notes on what's happening here in the desert. And, and they come. We've got uh, students from all over the world that are coming here to learn how to grow in difficult conditions, water management. The Arava Research and Development Center hosts various scientific activities and provides support for the region's farmers, landscapers, and gardeners. But it all started with the first Jewish pioneers that settled here during the establishment of Israel. I think it's also the attitude, you know? It's the, it's the chutzpah to say that if you put your heart and soul in something, you can make it heaven. If you will it, it is no dream. The center, which is funded by the Ministry of Agriculture and Jewish National Fund, houses eight acres of greenhouses. Wow, it's so nice in here. Yeah, it's pretty green and cool. Yeah. This is actually just uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, all the agriculture that we grow here in the, in the Arva. So what do we have here? Sunflowers, melon, watermelon. Yeah. Now, these are all experiments on how to grow in these conditions. These are all part of experiments. For example, you can see here really nicely the drip irrigation that we implement here in the Arva. Mm -hmm. Uh, some techniques of how to grow vertically yep. so you can uh, maximize your use of land and space. The soil here in the greenhouse is not local Arava soil, rather it's brought in from other parts of the country. Basically everything here is not good for agriculture, mm -hmm. but the people here are good for agriculture and that yeah. makes all the difference. Yeah, as long as you have the hope and the knowledge then you can make the desert bloom. Interestingly enough, the fruits and veggies grown in the Arava are sweeter than usual. And that's because growth under stress makes many plants produce more sugar than average. This is sold in Israel? 
What is this? This is actually an ornamental squash uh, that we uh, grow here. A part of an experiment to see whether it can cope with the, the natural conditions of the region. This is a Gulliver spinach, as you can see. It's not your typical spinach. This is considered to be a superfood, kind of like kale. Uh, it's actually an experiment that we are now in the process of learning how to grow it. You can give it a taste. It? Yeah, I, I like it. It's kind of meaty and has a very mm. refreshing taste. This has a, a thick texture. I feel like this would be good for stuffing, stuffing it huh? or rolling it up and making spinach. The legamre. I, I tried it instead of cabbage, and it's not you know when the cabbage leaves when you cook it, it becomes like yeah, it rips it mushy, and then it it, it, it tears up. The visitor center offers an interactive and unique way to get a better understanding of what the arava is all about. This is the playroom. Okay, this is a live museum where we, uh, as opposed to other museums, uh, invite you to touch and experiment for, you, for yourself. Ooh, look at that fly. That is not something I'd want to be on my fruit. Let's see how we fight the fruit fly in the Arava. Now you can change the topographic map. It will change as you shape it, and you can make it green. You can build your own stream, stream your own body, your oh. own reservoir. This is a glimpse to a family's life in the Arava. Uh, this is uh, the Canaan family. One of the researchers were working here at the Arava Research and Development Center. Although the Arava's residents face many challenges, they're constantly researching and experimenting new ways in order to improve the desert lifestyle and to develop the region. You can't live here without having a passion to the region and without the understanding that you will need to reinvent yourself all the time. You know, there are many people that think that Israel's desert region it's just a place of camels, not much going on here. But obviously today on the show we learned that that's not true. That's, that's fact. It's not true, but there are camels here. You know, we still like to yeah. go visit them. And I know someone that is actually making her own cosmetic line made out of camel's milk. I've heard camel's milk is very nourishing. Yes, there's a lot of uh, cool benefits to it. You can go learn all about it um, in a village, a Bedouin village, um, and learn about their culture as well. Interesting. Right. People think in the desert there is no a lot of herbs, but I can see a lot. area where I where I'm standing there are nearly five. This is Miriam, an Israeli woman of Bedouin descent who picks herbs weekly in the Negev town of Tel Sheva to use in her cosmetic line Desert Daughter. For centuries the Bedouin tribes have been inhabiting the desert regions of Israel. Their traditional healing practices have been preserved and used until this very day. Uh, this is the Yafruka Midbar, uh, we call it the soap of the desert. People used to just cut it, put it in hot water, and after that use it for the hair, for the body, for the clothes. Maria grew up seeing her grandmother collecting wild desert herbs and turning them into healing or beauty remedies. Harnessing her grandmother's wisdom, Miriam turned these ancient practices into a thriving international business. Here this is one of our best um, uh, oils, we call it Gaisum oil. It's a herb that we pick from the desert. Uh, Gaisum is very uh, known and very famous. Uh, with the Gaisum, we put uh, uh, another eight herbs, like all together, there are nine. If you want to try a little bit of the, the sure, this, I'd love yeah. to. Is yeah. this for the hands? Yeah, this is for the hand, for dry skin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for foot as well, elbows. It's very, dangerous. very moisturizing. And also, it has uh, the verbena uh, lemongrass uh, smell. Yeah. 
um, and it's very yeah, exactly. Wow. Some of the products in the cosmetic line is made only with natural herbs, while others incorporate pure camel's milk, which is a valuable source of vitamins and minerals. You guys are probably the only cosmetic line using camel milk, right, into your products. Yeah, very few. Uh, what, now what's good start. about camel's milk? Uh, for your camel skin? milk is very good for the skin. Uh -huh. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals. Camel milk known. That is the only milk which has vitamin C. Vitamin C usually we take, uh, we find it in the vegetables, fruits, yeah. but not in the in the milk. And this how explain how the Bedouin lived in the desert without uh, growing uh, a lot of uh, fruits because they took the vitamin C from the camel milk. Here on the farm, it's not only about the cosmetic line. Miriam also hosts visitors from all across the world to come visit her at her hometown and embrace the ultimate Bedouin experience. I know Sarah Bita, a Bedouin. They are from the call. She call the Bedouin. Shani Shabru. They masorit. From the desaj, we don't have to make them. We are doing Bedouin. We are doing it in ash, not in gas. But the pork is a bit difficult to make. <laughs> Although her family had once expected her to carry on the traditional roles of a Bedouin woman, Miriam forged her own path here in Israel, choosing instead to pursue her dreams. When I came 24 years old to tell my parents that I want to make a business and I want to write a book, they became so angry because they wanted me to get married because the marriage for a woman is most important here. In the Bedouin culture, most women get married at a young age and forego a college-level education. But not Maria, who instead flew to London to study for a bachelor's degree. And that was when she realized her true calling in life was back here in the Israeli desert, adapting the ancient secrets of her culture to modern times. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Cruising Israel. We're so happy that you tuned in to watch the program. And don't forget to catch us next time as we cruise the country and show you the best Israel has to offer. Bye.